Hello, Emerald City Comic Con. How are you guys doing this morning? It's still morning, right? Did we win? Did we all get out of bed? <laughs> Excellent. My name is Mark Bernard, and I'm here for Sci-Fi Wire here at Emerald City Comic Con. ECCC hashtag, it's a fan thing, hashtag, all the other hashtags. Uh, I am here with, uh, with a friend of mine. This is kind of fun. Um, Afua Richardson, uh, the amazingly talented artist who uh, we will talk to for the next 45 minutes or so. Kind of about where she came from, how she got here, and what she wants to do next, and a bunch of other things in between. Um, but first, what are we going to draw today? Uh, I was thinking maybe a Dora Milaje from Black Panther, World of Wakanda. Ooh. Or a Captain Marvel. It's, let me, let me uh, okay, think. show of hands. Uh, Dora Milaje? Captain Marvel. Oh, Dora Milaje, it is. Dora's win. <laughs> Dora wins. Dora wins. All right. All right. Well, let's, cool. let's get going. You're ready? Cool. Let us get into it. All right. Let's see. I moved my hair out of the way. I, I feel like we need to talk about your, your, your outfit. <laughs> I feel like if we don't, we're just leaving it on the table. <laughs> uh, how, did you, how did you feel about the Captain Marvel movie? You know, I actually haven't seen it yet. I know. Oh. Like it's, I know. I haven't what? seen it yet. I saw Battle Angel. <laughs> I'm going to see it. I just didn't get to see it before I came here. So. Gotcha. Then, uh, oh. then were you a fan of the comics? Were you a fan of Kelly Sue's run on Captain Marvel? I did. I did. It was pretty. It was pretty awesome. It was like this. I don't know. I kind of felt like uh, she reinvigorated the line. Um, and her new costume too, that, that kind of, because like, technically, if I'm wearing this costume, then I'd be Monica Rambeau, That's right? true. OG, Captain Marvel. <laughs> Come on, represent. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, I know they made her, her suit a lot more military-esque, and it, it kind of fit the character and the progression of like, where she was going with it. She's pretty hardcore. So let's, let's go all the way back. Let's go all the way back. Where, where were you born, Afua? In New York City. New York, represent I'm what part of the city? New York. Um, I was born in Harlem. And uh, I, I actually grew up kind of all over New York. So I spent time in, in Brooklyn and even on Governor's Island, that military base. Huh. How <laughs> yeah. did you end up there? <laughs> My, when it was an active military base, my, my dad was in the Coast Guard. He was the founder of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Coast Guard. So uh, we didn't have to travel too much. But we, it was like living in a, a separate world from New York. I mean, how do you even like, have friends over to, to hang out? You don't. <laughs> you, don't. <laughs> you have to go on a journey. I'll go on a voyage across the river and like know, to see that, my friends. You have to get on the tram. Did the tram go to Governor's Island? Uh, there was a ferry. The ferry. They had their own little 30 minute ferry just to make it there. And uh, I was a band nerd. Really? Well, we'll so get into I'd... why that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, equally uh, ostracized, I guess. So your dad was in the Coast Guard, mm -hmm, he was a mm -hmm. military guy. Um, you were a bit of a military brat. Um, what about your mom? Uh, she was a graphic designer. Uh, she was also in the military, but she did more war planning mm. and things like that. Uh, but my, my dad was definitely the one who encouraged me to get into the arts. He was an oil painter and a sculptor and a physicist. And he would just kind of leave me to my own devices and uh, I would listen to music and uh, draw and paint and just sit in my room and imagine stories and I think it sounds like Buckaroo Banzai. Your dad is like, oh no, he was a physicist and an oil painter in the Coast Guard <laughs> and like, what else did he do? Oh, he cracked time travel and... I actually thought my dad was Mr. T. <laughs> <laughs> no word of a lie, I thought he was Mr. T. I, because when he left to go to work, he kind of looked like him, except he didn't have, you know, the, the mohawk and the feather, obviously. <laughs> but um, when he would go to work, the A-team would come on. And one day he came home, and I'm like, Dad, 
are you actually Mr. T? <laughs> and he didn't say no. So, you know, so. I pity the fool. That, that's exactly what he said. And I was like, I knew it. <laughs> and I, I figured it out later. That you figured it out five years later. <laughs> out Way too Mr. late. <laughs> I know. It's like my, my son is like 13, I think, when we finally had the Santa Claus conversation with him. Oh. And I was kind of hoping that he'd come to this conclusion before I had to tell him. Oh. I was like, buddy, you cannot go into high school still thinking there's a Santa Claus. Like, this is not, this is not <laughs> cute, pal. That would be embarrassing. All day long. So I guess when you, when you first started to draw, when you first picked up a pencil, mm -hmm. it was not like a thing your parents were weird about. Not at all. Yeah, they encouraged me very much, or it, at least my dad did. He, um, he felt like art helped develop your emotional intelligence. Mm. And I was very shy and very quiet and wouldn't say very much. I would sing a lot, but I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't say what I was feeling. I wouldn't say if I needed something. Um, but I would draw it, and he would know something was wrong if my artwork looked a little distressed. Like um, you always see in those, like, here's the drama about the kid who's troubled, and what's he drawing in class? And everything's like black with red <laughs> lightning bolts and doll stabbed with knives. Like, I think Timmy's upset. <laughs> you never got quite there. Exactly. This is so interesting to draw with because it's, it's constantly moving. <laughs> so I'm like, ah. You're on the go. So now, when did, uh, when did comic books enter your life? When was, it, uh, when was it something you, even, like, did your dad bring them home? Did your mom bring them home? Did you stumble upon them at the, at the salon or the library? Um, when I was, I lived on Governor's Island when I was nine. And that's, I think, when I picked up my first comic book. Uh, there was, one of the officers had, like, a Wolverine number one. And he was like, you know what? I've got two of these, and one of them's for you. And uh, <laughs> I loved Wolverine. I mean, when I was a little kid, uh, a friend of mine, I, I didn't quite remember this, but he did. First day of kindergarten, he was like, hi, my name is John. And I say in reply, I can shoot my nails out. <laughs> so, I think <laughs> I, I think I was very primed for comics. Pretty young. I don't know who first introduced them to me, but after I had that one comic, uh, that was it. I started collecting Excalibur and Swamp Thing and, and just all of the, the outcast and, and weirdos who were pushed to the fringe. Uh, no matter where I was, I, I kind of felt like an, an outsider. People were very nice and welcoming. I just, I was very much in my own head. And so I liked comics that were about heroes that didn't necessarily get thanked or get welcomed by uh, communities because I, I, I kind of, I felt that way even when people were, were nice to me. So would you have considered yourself more of a Marvel kid or a DC kid? Marvel more. or DC? Early on, Marvel. And after Mark Wade and Alex Ross, Kingdom Come, it, it, it evened out for me. Okay. And what I noticed, a big difference between the two of them was uh, Marvel characters are humans who get godlike powers, and DC are gods who have to remember their humanity. Okay. So I mean, think about it. You've got like Wonder Woman and Superman, and they're they're the Adonis, the Artemis, Superman. the Diana. You know, they're the Flash is Mercury, you know, they're, they're these iconic forces of nature who have to kind of dial it back a little bit and remember, okay, yeah, I need to, like, Clark Kent is Superman's cosplay. That's his, that is his, you know, that's his secret identity, not, not Superman. Superman, who he, that's who he is all day. Like, right. you know, he has to hide, you know, that part of himself uh, away. Yeah, it, it's funny. I mean, at least for me growing up as a kid in New York, I was a Marvel guy, you yeah. know, like because you could walk down the street and there is, oh hey, there's the buildings, and right. there's, that's kind of what the, the that's that's what the Daily Planet would be, because sorry, the Daily Bugle would be, because it's in the Flatiron Building, and I can go find it. Hell's Kitchen is a place, and I can go <laughs> and I can like have lunch in Hell's Kitchen, whereas DC was always we knew it was kind of supposed to be New York, right? But not really. 
<laughs> and so the fact that Spider-Man was from Queens, you know, and like that's for real, not like <laughs> right? it's a real Smallville. Place. He's from Queens. It uh, it spoke to me in a real way. And I think also, at least for me, the the outcast nature of it, as well. Like the X-Men was my entry vehicle. Those are, those are my first drugs for comics, and it was because these were the kids who didn't fit in. These were the kids who, you know, were laughed at in school. These were the kids who didn't understand why their bodies were doing things that they couldn't explain and couldn't control. And then, similarly for me, it was Dark Knight Returns is what brought me to DC. Like, oh, it's this big, giant thing that's amazing for you, Kingdom Come, for me, Dark Knight, and Watchmen at the same time. And so when you, when you were this kid who was drawing a lot and singing a lot and reading a bunch of Wolverine comics and occasionally flirting with DC, um, <laughs> what did you think you wanted to be when you grew up? Um, <laughs> when I was three years old and, well, in preschool, and I got asked, what do you want to be when you grow up, Afua? First I said, the president. And my preschool teacher took a puff on her cigarette. <laughs> Honey, that's a man's job. And I was like, oh. Okay, well, um, but I want to be Michael Jackson. <laughs> She's like, I'm sorry to tell you, honey. That's a man's job, too. <laughs> what? Michael Jackson is a man? <laughs> I was like, but he's got long hair <laughs> and such a high-pitched voice. And he's doing things that we don't even know he's doing yet. Right? I was like, there's nothing left then. What, what do I do now? <laughs> um... I actually wanted to be a doctor. I, I loved biology and I loved studying the body and I really got into track and field after watching the Thundercats. I was like, Chitara is my everything. <laughs> I want to be an Olympian. So I thought I was going to join the Olympics like Jackie Joyner Kersey. And Chitara, I, I just figured she must have won. Clearly, you know, all the things. Like all of the things. And uh, when I was nine, I started picking up the flute. And it was something that was, it came very easily for me. Mm -hmm. And I really, really enjoyed it. It was very, very expressive. And I, I spent all of my hours drawing and playing the flute. Um, art was still there, though. I went to uh, LaGuardia High School for the Performing Arts and studied a little bit at Juilliard because the, the school was adopted by Juilliard. It was right across the street. And then I realized I don't want to be a classical flautist. <laughs> Did, uh, cause, cause if you guys in the crowd don't know, the LaGuardia High School for the Arts was also the fame school. Yes. Did you guys do like the awesome concerts out on the street? Did you go and like take over the taxi cabs and? We did. Yeah, yes. okay. We would sing on the subways. <laughs> nice, all right. I feel like that feels like a rite of passage. Like guys, it's true. fame high school, we gotta do it every year. Like senior cut day is, let's go and take over a city bus and sing on it. People enjoyed it, but um, I started beatboxing, strangely, and mimicking mimicking singers until I eventually became a singer and I started singing background and I got to go on tour with some really great folks but while I was doing that I made my own flyers so I was drawing my friends as like cartoon characters and um, turning myself into little characters writing all these little stories but I didn't think that there was any room for me in comics I didn't go to school for art so looking at things like heavy metal where you have you know Mobius and Serpieri and Frank Rosetta, like, those guys are iconic and amazing and like, they're fine artists, they're just drawing space wizards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I, I understood from studying classical music, like, listen, you've got to study for years before you're really good at anything and I'm okay with not being the best at this. I just enjoy this. Mm. But I couldn't let art go. It was my, it was my go-to 
for expression. There are things that you can say in art that you can't necessarily say in music. It was a little more tactile. Is that when you started to, I guess, produce art under a pseudonym, under Lakota Sioux? Yes. And, and, and what prompted you to do that? What prompted you to not be a Fua Richardson and instead Lakota Sioux? Well, first, I love secret identities. <laughs> I thought that was, I thought that was cool to have, just an alias. <laughs> uh, but also, I didn't want people to not like my art because they liked my music. Mm. I wanted there to be a separation or uh, like say for instance uh, someone like Puff Daddy you know like Sean John is the same person but you wouldn't necessarily have to be a Puffy fan in order to get uh, his clothes yeah. I mean, so that, I thought there should be a distinction and that happens know. all the time especially with with female creators you know JK Rowling wrote a series yeah. of crime novels under Robert Galbraith I think, just to see, like, what, what happens if I write a book and release it into the world and nobody knows it's me? Yeah, is will, it good enough to stand on its right, own? Will people buy it anyway? Will people, will people respond to the work not bringing a whole series of expectations or, or emotional baggage to it because they know that, oh, I'm this happy Harry Potter lady and she wrote a mystery. It becomes, oh no, just take the mystery on its own. You know, and eventually people found out who it was and they, they the skullduggery of the internet, which is <laughs> right. too often nobody's friend, <laughs> revealed her secret. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's always interesting to say, you know, can, can people respond to the work on its own? Can yeah. people come to it with an open mind, with no preconceptions as to who did it or why? And also, I felt like I was learning. I, I was learning from people and getting feedback. And I didn't want people to coddle me. I didn't want people to say, like, oh, you are this rare bird who likes drawing comics. We will not scare you away, strange bird. <laughs> Please stay with us geeks here. I'm like, no, I just, tell me what's wrong with it. Tell me what, what anatomy's off. Like, let me, don't, don't worry about my feelings. It's okay. I come from classical music. They're terrible there. <laughs> you're flat. Like, there's nothing like being told you're flat to, to let you know, like, you're, you're, you're off in life. So I wanted to improve, and I understand, like, you, you can't just say you're terrible, give up, and that'll completely defeat someone, but I wanted the, the feedback of, okay, if I want to do this professionally, I'm going to put it out into the world. What do people feel about it? And I didn't want to base my work off of what folks felt necessarily, but I just wanted another pair of eyes on it. So I went under Lakota Sioux because it was very androgynous. Mm -hmm. And no one really knew if I was male or female. They were just like, oh, dude, this is great, but try this instead. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and now things are different. Like, people are, are, are very different, uh, but... And then what, comics was still pretty niche. Yeah. And so what, when did you, I guess, come out of the shadow from Lakota Sioux? When did you decide to own that work again? I think when I did my first Marvel cover. Mm -hmm. uh, it was sort of an accidental cover. A friend of mine had a book called Half Dead, and it got picked up by Marvel. And they wanted to make the check out to Lakota Sioux. And I was like, oh, you know what? No, <laughs> that's OK. It, I, I think it's, it's me. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it instead. And, and it was also kind of a time to say, oh, all right, I think my work isn't the best. There are many people who are very advanced and have been in the industry way longer. And there's so much that I can learn. but. I think I'm at a point now where I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm okay. I can give myself a small pat on the back and say, hey, I'm not bad at this. I will claim this artwork. Nice. I think that is about where our stories intersect. Yes. Which is, uh, I, along with a, with a buddy, uh, Adam Freeman, had pitched a book to almost everywhere. Um, we pitched it to, to Marvel, to DC, to Wildstorm, to Dark Horse. Um, it was a book called Genius, and it was about a 17-year-old uh, girl from South Central who decides to secede from the Union through force after living under the foot and under the heel 
of uh, a somewhat tyrannical police force and government system. And, uh, and so it's about this sort of teenage revolutionary and uh, who's also the greatest military mind of a generation. And we were looking for an artist. And, you know, the, the, the job was comb the internet, like find somebody amazing, find somebody who could bring something to the work, bring something of herself to the work. Um, we were looking for a female artist on purpose um, because we wanted, we wanted somebody to be able to bring that sense of, of the reality of the feminine to this book written by two dudes. And, uh, and you know, I stumbled upon LakotaSue.com, I think is what it was. And, you know, just link diving for days. And I, I don't even remember who, who led me there. And I'm like, oh, hey. Oh, hey. <laughs> and so we reached out and we started talking. And, and lo and behold, Afua was the artist for the, uh, the first cycle of Genius. What was your perspective on it when we first started talking? I don't think we've ever had the, the like, <laughs> right? let's have an interview conversation about this. <laughs> um, yeah, like, what did, you, what did you think when this first came across the, the internet? It was interesting because at that time, I just, I just left my job. So the timing was really perfect because I, I was still working at a jingle house. I was, I was a secretary. I was doing the graphic design. I was uh, singing on commercials and doing voiceovers. But I was still drawing, and that was, that was my focus. I was like hoping for it. Like I really want to do this more than anything else. So the summer before, I went to San Diego Comic-Con for the first time, and I met Mark Silvestri in, in person. And I walked up with my little postcard and said, I love your work. Can I buy something? Um, well, if you need a colorist, here's my best work. I didn't want to hand a giant portfolio to him <laughs> and say, tell me what's wrong with my work. I knew he was there to sell books, and I appreciated what, he, what he's done and what he has done. And um, He actually recognized the Half Dead cover as he tried to pick that book up. And a year later, when I get the call, I'm like, oh my gosh, if I hadn't like decided, yeah, I'm going to do art full time, I would not have been available to do the book. And so I thought, OK, I'm supposed to do this. <laughs> It's Destiny, <laughs> which is the name of the character. Yeah. Um, nice job. And uh, I thought when I, first, when I first heard the idea, I was like, you know what? This sounds cool. It's not just another, here's a chick in the hood, you know, hood versus the cops. It was a little more complicated. Mm. You know, on one side, you had a girl who was a tactical genius, and that kind of skill is almost wasted in a non-war zone. So what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. And I started really thinking about the mindset of someone growing up in the system. I had friends who lived in you know, foster home after foster home, uh, friends who were gang members who felt they were trapped. You know, so I really started leaning on who they were and the experiences that they had when uh, when drawing this, but when I got the script and I saw the very first page with the police officer being shot, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be strung up. <laughs> like, I'm going to be fried for this. Uh, because I, coming from a military family, you know, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, like, I don't want to illustrate killing a police officer. That, that's not what I want. But as I started reading and moving forward, on it and seeing where you were going with it, I, I felt myself more and more aligning with all sides of the characters, like a Gray and, and his deciphering like what's happening, uh, and uh, as well as uh, Destiny sort of strategically moving through all of the groups, taking out the leaders and uh, moving her way up. I was like, man, I am learning so much <laughs> about uh, just politics and seeing how things actually work in doing the research for the book. I actually became an activist. <laughs> 
uh, after after doing so. so You're welcome was... slash I'm sorry. What's that? <laughs> You're welcome slash I'm sorry. <laughs> it was okay. It like not not in a way that was like I'm gonna go out on the street and be angry and you know blow up blocks of Los Angeles. I uh, I started seeing well what can I do? Right. What can I do with the skills that I have to actually make a difference in my immediate area? Like, what kind of skills can I give to people around me to help them be better people? Mm -hmm. um, as, uh, as John Lewis would call it, good trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Get into good trouble. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so, yes, Genius was 2009 to 2011 or so. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of doors did that, did that book open for you? What, where did you find yourself after that? What did you find yourself wanting to do? Well, it was terrifying because the book came out how many days before the events of, yeah, of Ferguson, Missouri? It was, it was like a month before Ferguson Ooh. blew up. People thought that I was taking uh, images from the newspaper and headlines and putting it in the comic. Like, they, they were asking, like, did you just go there? And, because <laughs> this looks exactly like what's happening, like, up the block. Um, but it opened so many doors for me. Right after, I got asked to work on Captain Marvel. <laughs> and um, I was asked, like, what would you, what would you love to work on? I was like, I love the X-Men. I would love to work <laughs> on the X-Men. So I got to work on one of the hip hop covers. And uh, I became a, an official woman of Marvel. I, I worked on Batman after that. And then uh, some of my proudest moments on Black Panther World of Wakanda, um, which was cool because uh, I spoke to the CG team who developed the Black Panther suit uh, in Atlanta. And they told me that they had my work open, as well as, you know, John Romita and Brian Stelfreeze in designing his suit. So I was like, a piece of me is in there. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, when we, we were working on Genius together, you were working almost entirely digitally. Yes. Right? Um, and I can't help but notice, right now, you're drawing entirely analogally. Is that a word? Analogally? Kill me now. Um, what, for you, what determines whether or not you're going to work digitally and in sort of pencil and pen? I, um, I actually start off traditionally. Like, I'll, I'll scribble things out and just like this, it's a mess. <laughs> I'll get into, I'll leave all the lines in and figure out where I want to go, but cleaning up I learned how to refine my work digitally. That was my final paintbrush. Uh, because I didn't go to art school, my uh, computer training came from going to jobs that had computers and Photoshop on it, and I spent my lunch breaks learning how to paint there because I didn't have enough money to keep buying paper and supplies. So I was like, well, there's an infinite amount of space here at least as much as my hard drive could hold, and I don't have to keep buying paint <laughs> and new colors. And it made corrections easier. I could have more vibrant colors. I could play with contrast a lot easier. And you could also blow things up and reduce them without losing the integrity of the work. Or starting completely from scratch if you happen to mess up. <laughs> An image. And actually, Genius was my first cover to cover comic. So I was learning as I went along, and I had to learn that you can't have every page a cover. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly. Sadly. Or you will be there forever. Unless you're Alex Ross. <laughs> well, I mean, we all can't be Alex Ross. <laughs> no. Nor should we all be Alex Ross. This Hi, is Alex true. Ross. I'm waving at his booth over there, even though he's never there. You can just spend 20 grand on a print. Um, did somebody laugh at that? Awesome. I just want an Alex Ross joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so after the, the, the Wonderful World of Wakanda, which I know that's not what it's called, but I feel <laughs> like when the Wonderful World of Disney and Wakanda meet, it's the Wonderful World of Wakanda. 
after that, um, what did that lead you to? Like, there's, there, I, re I recall seeing, and I also recall reading, an amazing book that you did with John Lewis. Oh, yes. Um, interestingly enough, I think they're going to go in another direction with that book. Yeah, I, I finished the book, but I think maybe my art was a little too different from the previous artist. Hmm. But it was still an honor to work on it because I got to not only dig into uh, civil rights history, but a, a bit of my own. Uh, there are Lewis's in my family, and I'm trying to figure out if we are actually related. But I, um, I learned from my dad that a lot of these civil rights activists were from his hometown and he knew them personally and he sort of added a an extra element of personal feeling to to the book he was like i remember when that was going on you know this is where i was and this is what was happening and a few of my friends died and you know this was the feeling of the time mm. you know so it wasn't just my reporting this happened then this happened at that time it was, this is the feeling of the time. Now pour that into a page. So it was very, very educational for me. Um, I feel like churning out 150 pages was like, yeah, I, I can do this. And it was my first time working in black and white. Mm -hmm. which I love working in color, and I think I see things a lot more clearly in color than uh, in a black and white contrast. But it, it helped me bring out more of my, my volume and my values in my work, so. Yeah, I mean, it feels like every, everything that you get to do, everything an artist gets to do, is helping to build for the next thing you're going to do. And also, even to be able to say, I did that. Yeah. Like, I pulled that off. Like, I, I wasn't sure if I could going in, and I did it, and so the next thing will be a little bit easier because I learned some lessons and I got some information about myself. Exactly. In the process. What, uh, Every book is a lesson. I, I learned so much uh, about myself moving from uh, story to story. Yeah, and if the, and if the work isn't challenging, then <laughs> yeah. you're never growing, right? Like if you, oh, if definitely. You do that you can always do, you never <laughs> learn from it. It's like, oh man, you made me do a thing I hadn't done before. There were so many times that I cried while working on Genius. <laughs> I was just like, this is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this is really intense. And uh, I, I just... So some of the sketches that I have have these like watermarks oh. in them, like especially like the very last page, the very last panel. I was like, I'm, I'm finished with this. This is over now. Like this is no longer a part of my life. What do I do now? <laughs> well, I mean, in that I, I think it's always a question of what's next. Yeah. Right? You know, the, yeah. What, what else do I want to pour my soul into? What else do I want to devote my time to? Um, for you, what, what is the dream? Like, if you could do anything, if you could draw anything, if you could convince anybody, what would that be? Ooh. Right now, I am writing and drawing a project called Aquarius, the Book of Myrrh. And it's a modern retelling of mermaid myths, myths and legends from all over the world. And I'm starting with my own family. Um, I had no idea that there were so many Native American and West African aquatic myths. And I started speaking to marine biologists and different people who study landscapes. And it's been really amazing just doing all of the research mm. for this. So this is really exciting for me because this is my, my first creator own since becoming a professional. And I feel like it's really my time to say what's on my heart, so this is, this is exciting. Um, oh, and awesome. it'd be cool to work on some animation, too. Like, I, I, I love comics. There is something very unique about comics that can't be translated into any other thing. Like, it, it, you fill in the voices and the in-between. The, the panels lead you places, but you're the person directing and uh, filling in those blanks, and that's something that I absolutely love uh, about comics. So I want this to be a comic book first before anything else because it's just so unique, and, and that is my first storytelling love. So, yeah, I mean, comics is of all the literature forms the most interactive. Yes, because the, the reader is like you said, it's filling in the blanks between the, the gutter. 
the gutter is where the reader comes in. Yes. The, the white between the frames is where the reader comes in. And there's also this, I mean, I, I found in working in comics and working in journalism and working in television, there is kind of no more direct route between the creator and the audience. Yes. There are so few filters between what you want to put in a comic book and what the reader reads in a comic book. Whereas in TV, there's hundreds of people who have to be part of it. There's dozens of people who have to approve things. There's millions of dollars that have to be spent that need to be questioned and, and refined and re-examined and re-litigated. But with comics, it's, hey man, here's the story I want to tell. Great, I sent it to an artist. Great, we sent it to an editor. Great, they sent it to a printer. Right. And, and there's so little drift. There's so little intention drift between that first impulse and what's on the page. And that's what makes it special, is that you can, you can tell stories in that medium that you can't tell anywhere else. You know, you're unburdened yeah. by the realities of budget, you're unburdened by the realities of scope. All you have is the amount of time you have to spend on it and your, your imagination. And that, those are the only limits in comics. And so I'm so happy that it's still a form that you find uh, invigorating, you know, because comics has a way of <laughs> breaking your heart. It's true. <laughs> I, uh, I had a, love you back. a great experience at one of the shows that I went to. I agreed to do a whole bunch of commissions, so I brought them with me to the hotel restaurant, and I was sitting at one of those um, shared tables with a family, and I was working on Black Panther, and the, the guy next to me asks, are you one of the artists? Are, are you guys here for the show, the, the comic con convention? And I said, yeah, that guy made Rocket Raccoon. That guy, you know, I introduced him to everybody at the table, and he said, oh man, my buddy, I, I wish, I wish he were here, he couldn't make it, uh, but he really loves Black Panther. Could I get you to sign something? He was like, wait, actually, I don't, I don't think I have anything with me. Hold on, let me find something. I was like, wait, you know what? Do you have a cell phone? Let's do a video, say, hey man, we're here at Ace. You know, like, I, I wish you were here. Um, Wakanda forever. <laughs> 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 And uh, we, we sent the message out. He goes upstairs, you know, puts his son to bed. He comes back downstairs and says, you know, I've been trying to get my son to read anything for a while. But what you did for our friend moved him so much. He told me, she writes comics? I want to read comics. Aww. And so he bought his first comic book from me the very next day. I was like, oh man, I don't want to cry on a weekend. I, I have too much makeup in my, on my cosplay. But it was really, really, it was really heartwarming because I remember those people who, who gave me books to read that really changed me. And just the way comics expanded my mind, I, I, I love sharing that with somebody else who has not had that experience yet. Yeah, I was going to ask you about some fan interactions, and you beat me to it, so <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Great. Um, instead, I kind of want to talk about what it's like becoming a member of the comic book community, you know, because the, the people who make comics, there's, there's but so many of us, um, you know, the, and, and they're scattered all over the country, they're scattered all over the world. But when we come to places like this, to Emerald City, to San Diego, to New York, to Angoulême in France, or Thought Bubble in, in, in the UK, it, it feels as if we are all part of the same tribe and all in the same place. What does it feel like being welcomed into that community as a previous outsider? It's like an extended family. You know, we were all in the trenches together and we all understand what it is to make comics and how much of ourselves we, we pour into it. And comic conventions, are a really rare place. What other industry do you know that you can meet the creators of your favorite books and your favorite anything all in one place? The writer, the CEO, the editor, all together. It's a very unique industry, especially coming from music. You would never meet the CEO of Sony 
at a convention. So you Clive know. Davis has a booth. <laughs> right? Let's go talk to Clive. That'd be amazing. Like, Aronofsky is right over there. So it, it's, it's very unique and it's a lot of fun coming to shows because it's the exact opposite of what I do every day. I wake up in the morning, there's my cat, there's my husband, here's my table. I commute from my bed <laughs> to my office. And that is all. And I don't really see anyone. And sometimes I don't even know if what I'm doing is impacting anyone. Have, have they seen it? I just send it off. And it's like, all right, well, I hope you like it. <laughs> but then I come here and I'll, I'll get to interact with folks who love the same things that I do and we nerd out about it for hours on end and uh, also just hear the, the triumphs and the woes and it's really great to, to just have a job making things that you love. You know, making the transition from working a nine to five, which there's nothing wrong with, to my nine to nine, <laughs> or I, I never really stop working, being something that once I'm finished with it, I'm really proud of it. That's basically the primary difference. Like, I'm going to work. It's going to be hard. People say, like, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a lie. It's if you love something, you will cry for it. You will fight for it. You will kind of beat yourself up to be better. You will be good to yourself to be better. And it will be painful because you feel so strongly about it. But when you're finished with it, you look back and you remember like, yeah, I, I completed this. So being a part of that is, feels like being a superhero. <laughs> And also, I mean, you know, we've talked about it before, I think I've mentioned before on the stage, that comic book conventions are among the rare places that you can visit that are entirely fueled by love. You know, people who come to places like this are coming because they love this stuff, because they love a specific angle of it. Like, I love science fiction novels, or I love cosplay, or I love video games, or I love comic books, or I love comic books, or I love comic books. And this is a place that is fueled by and buoyed by that love. And it's wonderful to come to a place that is just, you know, that's the overriding emotional state. Is I came because I like this stuff. I came because these other people with me like this stuff. And we together can just be in a safe space that's all about our love for this thing. And that's kind of wonderful. It especially is. today. That right. you can find your tribe and have a place to gather and be your most self-selves. That's also not English. Definitely. But it's, it's still early. I was chatting with some folks yesterday, and I just have to say, Seattle, your town is awesome. Like, really, like, it's a really beautiful town, and everybody's just so nice here. I, like, I was t sharing with someone uh, a little bit about a, a story that I'm working on, and I, it reminded them of their grandfather and a time where they felt like they didn't know if they could move forward, and they kind of got a sign. It was a very unusual sign, like a whole bunch of porpoises were following after them. That was something that they associated with their grandfather. So we were talking about these different things that happen in stories that kind of give you the, hey, you're going to make it uh, reminders. And we were all crying. <laughs> and like, guys, only at only a Comic-Con <laughs> do you cry about stories because they, they embed knowledge, they remind us, they, they let us know that we, we can be heroic or give us a way to think about how we can make it out of impossible, deci uh, impossible circumstances. And man, sometimes do I need it. <laughs> <laughs> I need those reminders that I can be super. We all do. Without powers. We all do. All right, as we, as we come to the end of our live draw, where can the people find more of your stuff? What should they look for out in the world? Where can they find you out in the world? I am at afuarichardson.com. That's A-F-U-A richardson.com. On Instagram, I am Dr. Fu, D-O-C-T-A-F-O-O. -O. Awesome. And what do you have coming up in the, in the marketplace? 
What can, what can they buy to support Dr. Fu's mad experiment life? I've got some prints at afuarichardson.com in my Fu store. And uh, what's out right now? Actually, I just did a cover for Sanford Green's Bitterroot. So he's right upstairs. Go on ahead and, and support in the Artist Alley, or you can find them online. Awesome. And you're up in Artist Alley, too, right? Hmm? I am in Artist Alley. I am upstairs in, uh, on the sixth floor, all the way against the wall, A15. Everybody should go and buy as much as they can carry of the Fula <laughs> stuff so she doesn't have to carry it home. Uh, everybody, thank you so much, Afua, for drawing an amazing <laughs> version. I have it. I want it. I have it. Yeah. Um, but yes, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, thank you. Afua. And up next, Michael Christopher Heron and Andrea Fort talk songs for the dead. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.